Are you a dark dreamer? William F. Nolan has every reason to be one. Although best known for his classic novel of speculative fiction, Logan's Run, co-authored with George Clayton Johnson, Nolan is also an acknowledged master of dark fantasy and shock fiction. He is also an accomplished screenwriter, writing or co-writing such classic movies of the week as Terror at London Bridge and Trilogy of Terror. Among his published works in the field of dark fantasy are such acclaimed titles as Night Shapes, Things Beyond Midnight, Hell Tracks, The Winchester Horror, Down the Long Night, and Blood Sky. We recently spoke with Nolan at the Dark Delicacies Bookstore in Burbank, California to find out firsthand what it is like to explore the dark side of the arts. We've interviewed your collaborator, George Clayton Johnson, recently, and he told us a bit about the origins of Logan's Run. Could you tell us your story of how that novel came to be? Well, basically, we wrote it together. Uh, I'm sure George probably mentioned this down at a, a motel in Malibu. He was married at that time, I wasn't, so I would stay overnight there where he'd come down and work with me during the day and then go back to his family at night. So it was, uh, it took us about 21 days. We did the whole novel in three weeks. And the reason we did it so fast is because we were sort of running with Logan. We felt that uh, to keep him moving, we had to move fast ourselves and keep up with him. And so we had a kind of a, a large drawing on the wall uh, showing where he went, uh, subterranean or where he would, he would go to the uh, North Pole or wherever we sent him. We'd circle these things and we'd have these little lines in between them. And it was like a road map to where we were gonna send him. And we'd keep changing it as we thought up new ideas. And we, we'd uh, spell each other at the typewriter. He'd, he'd type for a while and then get up and then I'd sit there and type for a while. And uh, when the thing was finally done after three weeks, I knew it needed a, a final smoothing out, as it were, a final editing to give it the impression of being written by one person. So I took it up to San Francisco and rented a motel room and did a, uh, a smooth draft, if you want to call it that, up there, and then brought it back to George. He made a few corrections and that was, uh, that was it. That's how it started. But it really, um, it started just really with a, an idea I had about uh, uh, death begins at, uh, life begins at 40. Uh, I, I was lecturing at a UCLA class and uh, they, uh, they wanted an example of social fiction and science fiction. So I thought, well, if you're writing social fiction, death begins at 40, a man uh, runs off with a Las Vegas stripper and uh, leaves his family and ends up in Hawaii somewhere. If you're writing science fiction, the man may have to die at the age of 40. It may be a compulsory death society where it's an overpopulation situation. So that sort of developed into the idea of Logan's Run. And George and I, uh, we're gonna call it Morgan's Run, uh, which there's a new book out, just came out last week called Morgan's Run, I know, it's on the newsstands now. We were gonna call it Morgan's Run, but, but there was a movie in London that was released just that month, it was called Morgan. And so I said, well, my, my phone number back in Kansas City was Logan 6466, why don't we call it Logan's Run? So that's how the name Logan evolved. These, uh, there's, there's a story behind everything. <laughs> True enough. Now that was made into a feature film and also a television series. Oh, it's, it's gone all over the place. It started as a novel from Dial Press. Then it went into a, uh, an MGM feature movie that did very well. It was a hit of the summer in 1976. And then it became a CBS television series, 13 episodes of that. Uh, then, it, then I wrote two sequel novels were published around the world. The original Logan, uh, Logan novel was published in 28 editions, uh, 28 editions around the world in about nine or 10 countries. Uh, and then it went into fan clubs and uh, there was a Logan's Run organization of fans down in San Diego, several hundred people. I went down there and lectured and they had the people in their costumes dressed up as sand men and sand women and the whole thing. So that was fun, and there was a, there there have been fanzines, and now there are several Logan websites. There must be a half dozen Logan websites. So the thing did touch a nerve in people. It, uh, they they remember it. it. It sticks with them. And you feel that you've become a successful writer over the years. I've written about 40 scripts, and about 20 of them have died, and about the other 20 have been produced. So I've got a, a one out of two record, which is apparently quite good in Hollywood, from what I hear. Usually, you get one out of ten, you're lucky, you know. The name of this program is Dark Dreamers, and I want to tell you about a dark dream I had that resulted in hell tracks and short story and so forth. I was asleep, and I woke up, and I was in this twilight zone, to use an expression, between 
sleep and wakefulness where you're you're just sort of half awake and I, I remembered a dream I'd had which really perplexed me because it was about a cowboy on a, on a lonely abandoned depot on the plains of Montana and he was and he was a modern cowboy and he was waiting for a train and he was gonna he was gonna destroy the train because the train had killed his sister his sister had died on that train that's all I had and I thought well now that is weird I've never been to Montana I know nothing about the plains of Montana I'm certainly don't know anything about modern day sheep ranching which I knew he was from the dream he was a sheep rancher and I said I've got to I've got this is so strong the image of the train and the and the dead sister was so strong I I said to my wife you know we've got to get in the car and we've got to go to Montana so my wife and I bundled ourselves into the car and off we went to Montana and I met the sheriff of Lewiston Montana who, who was a lot like the character that I had created in the short story eerily like him and what was really spooky talk about dark dreams is that I get out on the plains of Montana and there is an old deserted abandoned station at call at, at, at uh, at Lime Fork, I think it was called, and it was uh, Ross Fork, R-O-S-S, Ross Fork, and it was right in the middle of the plains of Montana with the Little Belt Mountains in the background where the train lived, and it could, I, I could see it rolling down from those mountains to Ross Fork and picking up somebody on the depot. I could see the cowboy sitting there in this weathered depot uh, waiting for the train, and it all became very real, and yet I'd never been to Montana before, and it was a very spooky feeling. Bill, tell us about your story, Blood Sky. One of, the, one of the things that intrigued me about the idea was that I could put a sketchbook by a serial killer in the back of it, meaning that I could take a lot of my artwork of skulls and weird drawings and, and witches and so forth and put them into the mind of a serial killer as if this was his sketchbook. And here's a man I killed in Detroit on, on Sunday the 14th, and I do a little drawing of a guy. Here's, here's his son. I killed the father and son on the same day, and so I have two of my drawings. And I got a chance to use a lot of my artwork. Bill, could you tell us about the book The Winchester Horror? Right. Well, the Winchester Horror is set in Winchester House, and that's up at, in San Jose. It is a real place. Uh, Sarah Winchester, the widow of the man who invented the Winchester rifle, felt that because her husband had uh, her husband's rifle had killed so many people that she would be haunted by the ghosts. Uh, all of the people that died under the Winchester rifle fire would be haunting her, and, and she was told that the only way to keep herself from being haunted was to move into a house and just keep building it constantly day and night 24 hours a day keep expanding the house and as long as the house was fluid and moving and and was being built and was in a transitional stage the ghosts would be confused by this and they could not haunt her then she took that literally and she and she began she uh, bought a small farm in uh, in San Jose uh, I think a, a three bedroom farm a very small place and she began to build and 25 years or 30 years later we have Winchester House this uh, with with thousands of windows and doorways and stairs that lead up to nowhere and doors that open into into an abyss and windows that, that don't reflect anything and closets that are only three inches deep and all kinds of things just build 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 and I said to my wife gee you know I've always wanted to see Winchester House I'd really like to go up to San Jose this weekend and, and visit the place so up we went I got in Winchester House, and we were in what they call the seance room, where she used to uh, 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 have a seance in which she would try to dispel the ghosts that she felt were closing in on her. So anyway, I was in there, and I thought, boy, what a great place for a ghost story. I said, this, this is a great house for a ghost story. I said, hasn't anyone written a ghost story about Winchester House? I researched it. I didn't find any. I was amazed. I didn't find any. So I, I wrote the Winchester Horror, which is set in Winchester House with the ghost of Sarah Winchester coming back to defeat another ghost that enters the thing. It's too complex to go into now, but the plot involves the, the real house and the, the setting is real and all the rooms are real and the interiors are real. And so my research paid off and I had a lot of fun with that one. But do you share the belief that I have is that with real, true horror fiction or dark suspense or dark fantasy fiction, you can't fake it. Either you have, you're either born to write that type of fiction or you don't write it well. Well, let me talk about my childhood for a moment. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, one of my great loves during that period was supernatural horror. Uh, I started with H.P. Lovecraft. I read H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, his horror work, as well as his science fiction work. Uh, I read Algernon Blackwood. I read uh, L.P. Hartley. I, I read uh, all, of the, all of the major horror writers, and, and I, that was my first great love. I don't think you can write horror or dark fantasy unless you have a, 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 a love for it. I don't think you can fake it. You can't say, well, there's, there's some money out there, a publisher wants it, I'll just sit down and I'll write about a giant spider that eats people. No, unless you're really terrified of spiders, unless you've had some experience with spiders, uh, perhaps not giant ones, 
uh, as I did in Kansas City in our basement, I don't think you can really write about uh, a spider. I had uh, one scene in one of my uh, stories uh, where the guy comes home at night and he parks his car out and outside the house and he starts toward the house and he, he hears a scuttling sound and he looks over and hears this giant spider moving across the yard toward him about the size of an automobile. Uh, with the face of this woman that he hated. It had, it had a woman's face and the body of a spider. Well, I couldn't have written that unless I was scared out of my socks in Kansas City by running into a spider web in my basement. I don't think you can fake this stuff. It's got to be real. You, I scare myself. I sit there at a, at a coffee shop at 2 in the morning, and, and, I, and, the, and the hair goes up in the back of my neck as I'm writing about some of this stuff. And I think unless you can scare yourself, you're not going to be able to scare people. So, yes, it, it has to be indigenous. It can't be faked. And final question, in terms of being a dark dreamer, are you proud to say that uh, you are a dark dreamer? I love dark fantasy. I love, I love suspense. I love horrific uh, writing. And uh, the great thing about me in terms of my career, the thing that I'm most pleased about is that I've, I've written in a dozen genres and therefore I'm not considered a horror writer any more than I'm considered a science fiction writer because I wrote Logan's Run or a Western writer because I wrote a, a novel called Real Renegades. Or, or an aviation writer because I wrote The Sky Gypsy, uh, or, or a sports writer because I wrote about baseball and motorcycles and, and automobiles. Oh, so I haven't really been pigeonholed the way somebody like poor Stephen King has been. So luckily I've, I've managed to avoid that by jumping into so many genres and moving around. I, I'm, I'm too fast for them. Join me here again on the wild side of the imagination where a sense of wonder and a feeling of terror can often intersect. You'll find us waiting here, the dark dreamers. <laughs>